Ladies and gentlemen, I think we are now set to have the penultimate session before Cecilia Wigstrom will close today's activity. I'm only going to take a few minutes before handing over in the first instance to Jack Belkmans to offer just a few summarizing reflections on the basis of what I think has been quite an interesting and full day. And I've enjoyed personally listening to so many distinguished experts providing insights from so many different perspectives on this multi-level reality of the European Union. So what, in a few minutes, may I venture as a sort of conclusions about what we think we can do to help European admin administrations make the EU work better? Now, I've slightly modified the title, as you may have noticed, not only policy implementation, making European policies work, but taking into account the kind of comments that we've been hearing about democracy and governance, the need also to think about helping consolidate, well, let's call it good governance. I'd like to take three terms in order to peg these things onto, skills, values, and learning. Indeed, we began the day when Marco Ongaro started talking about skills and the need for civil servants to adapt. That the, the new world, with its digital challenges, its rapid change, needs to be equipped with civil servants able to fulfill these new tasks. And I think that we've already been involved, as you were saying, with the OECD, in, that, in thinking about how we can help share experiences and boost that kind of capacity among administrative staff. I was also interested to hear from the citizens' perspective. Anthony, you mentioned the need that public servants should be able to, I think I quote, obtain, understand, and use input. It's part of the new skill set, I think you were suggesting. And it's also a mindset. And here I go to Jean Severin's. You, I think you started your presentation by saying, open your minds. And I, you made the point that it's essential for civil servants at all levels, including the very important local and regional levels, to be, I quote you, I think, entrepreneurial in thinking about new ways of engaging with citizens, with stakeholders, and each other. Even the neighbours, you made the point that there's not always a habit of talking to your own fellow region next door. And I think the last panel raised several interesting points about the kind of skills that citizen, uh, civil servants need. Knowledge, if I may, you, you emphasize the point that people, sit, they need to understand the system, to think about it, to be able to explain it and defend it, I would say. To know each other. APE has always been involved, as was emphasized from the start, in bringing civil servants together. That was indeed the founding mission to help understand each other in order, in the first instance, to make the single market work. I would add one more, which I think is a big challenge, which is to do with the understanding of the roles of civil servants in this multi-level reality, what I've called the need to internalize multi-level realities. I'd like to quote another former colleague, Adrian Scout, who I put in that paper, that national servant, civil servants need to see themselves both as European public managers as well as defenders of national positions. Exactly. It's a mental challenge, it's a, it's a, it's a cultural challenge. I think, you, you, I think you may be in the same line here, Jacques. Are we going to internalize subsidiarity, another th that came up during the day, in a more positive way, and, and, and Monica, I'd like to link to national parliaments here, the subsidiarity control and all that. I, I think the national parliaments do, of course, have an essential role, but not only a defensive role, 
we have a yellow card, don't we? This, some call it the early warning system. To, this commission needs to be warned, don't do this. Thank God we never got the red card to send the commission off. But we never also got the green card, which was proposed in 2015 as a way to build this kind of level of partic critical participation in a positive light. So, skills, values. We started the day then with Alexander Stubb. I thought he made a very, co very cogent argument and emphasized, and I think we've all agreed in the course of the day, that values are what hold us together. To again, use your word, I think, the glue. The goals and the values. And if those get shaken, then the whole thing starts being challenged. I don't think we need to further discuss this here, but let me just reflect that maybe different kinds of values we're talking about here. One is, of course, the evident democracy and the rule of law. Very topical, fundamentally important. But I'd also like just to recall values of good governance. And I, I was thinking, I forget who it was who looked back 20 years to look for multi-level governance. I think it was Faden. Uh, I would remember almost exactly 20 years ago, give or take two months, the white paper on governance yeah. of the commission, which then pr proposed five principles which should be underlying what we do, two of which are to do with implementation, if you like, effectiveness and coherence. The other three are typical international standards of good governance, participation, openness, and accountability. And again, accountability is a word that's come up in several occasions today, quite rightly, because if we're looking now at multi-level administrative arrangements, and what this means for the role of individuals, but also national, regional, local systems, I hope this can come to be seen as a, a positive, a way of sharing responsibilities to achieve those common overarching goals and not a threat. We've heard several times today also how every level matters in things like the Green Deal and the Climate Action, climate pact, climate action pact, I forget. Where it's true, of course, as the point was made, that citizens, Anthony, you made the point of local, of citizen involvement. Daniele Dotto, you made the point about, what, was 90% of action for Green Deal is on the ground at local level? Jean, also you mentioned the importance of regional and cross-regional, cross-border. Those are also the level where most things are going to happen. But all this does have its downside. And now I go back to the panel first thing in the morning. If everybody's responsible, then of course... So we, we have something to sort out here. And I would like to think that as I come to my third word, which is learning, we can think about how APA can not only support the knowledge, the skills, but also some of the thinking about learning from these different challenges and experiences including methods, and Eduardo Ongaro, you, I think, put some of the key points on the table. We need to learn to learn, and to do it in a way that then are applicable. I was talking earlier with Hedwig about, the, remember, the open method of coordination. We've had previous experiences of trying to do this which didn't always quite work. And, and if we're talking about a next generation, I think there is a, a good argument for having a next generation in working out how we can learn from each other and from cases in a much more effective way. We can learn by looking at different sectoral arrangements. And this is what Ferdin, I think, was also pointing to. There's no one answer. But just like there are underlying principles of good governance that I think we can apply to evaluate the democratic quality of everything that goes on, there are certain elements of system design, which he came up with, which I think can also be used as a meta level to evaluate more objectively and more openly what we need to do. And finally, participation, going back to the end of the last panel. There's an awful lot of experience out there. Anthony, you mentioned it, Jean, local level. Everybody has mentioned it. We can systematically look at that and try and come to some conclusions about how citizens and parliaments can be better involved, as well as trying to make it work in the sense of the 
Making European Policies Work, which is the title of this event. I'm not sure that all of you are aware why it's the title of this event, so I'm going to tell you. Because this was the title of a, a work published in 1988 by the Institute, which I think has been recognized as, a, I quote, a pioneering study in comparing. You know, Jacques, this is a good bridge for me to hand over to you, because this was the time when you and others, about whom you're no doubt going to talk, were involved in these early stages of thinking about completing the internal market. And without further ado, I'd like to hand over to you now, before we look now to the future afterwards with Mario Nava, for your contribution of reflection about, I think we immodestly called it apron European integration or something like that. But I leave it to you to say whatever you think appropriate. And thank you very much indeed for joining us today to help round off the proceedings. I think Jack Pelkman's needs little introduction as a distinguished economist of European integration, working with SEPS, Brussels, College of Europe, and uh, you were our first professor, is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. So I think it's a great privilege, and we really do welcome your, your making the time to come here. I won't take any more of that time away from you. Thank you. Jack. Um, it's good to be back. <laughs> The rest of the speech matters a good deal less. <laughs> <laughs> but I joined the, 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 the crowd before me, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to congratulate all of you, currently part of the AIPA family, or indeed connected in the past 40 years uh, at some point in time with AIPA, with the 40th uh, birthday of AIPA. It's a cheerful moment. Um, like everybody who turns 40, you then have a history. Don't be afraid. I will not give detailed comments on the history. Of every history, there is no such history as only glory. That doesn't exist. So I refrain from that and try to live up in just 10 minutes. Pretty impossible. Um, some people can walk over water. I cannot. Uh, with the title, AIPA and European Integration, in 10 minutes. Um, I like that AIPA is first. <laughs> um, just remember, when AIPA was born, the EU was in deep recession after the second oil shock. Uh, and what was called stagflation, I hope Mario is already listening, because, um, you know, that's, he's a macroeconomist, that's very much his cup of tea, uh, it was called stagflation. The old people in the room, who should not be called old, of course, um, might remember this. In fact, it meant being stuck with high unemployment, high inflation, and few, if any, prospects for growth, in the short run at least. Pretty miserable. The core idea of the Rome Treaty, you remember that? You can actually read a treaty. I speak to the non-lawyers, of course. Non-lawyers don't read treaties. And although I was announced as an economist, I read treaties. It always makes me grow older much faster. But anyway, <laughs> the core idea of the Rome Treaty, namely that economic growth would be greatly stimulated by the EEC, had been totally lost when IPA was beginning. Uh, three of the five objectives of the Rome Treaty are on economic growth and development. Most people have forgotten that. In the 1950s, early 60s, growth, growth, growth. That was the motto. And the EEC Treaty was going to help. To, to, to. And indeed, in the 60s, we had growth rates of then already semi-developed or somewhat developed countries of 4% or more. Unbelievable. Um, by the early 80s, there was very little, if anything, left. The EEC had failed. So in 1982, when IPA really began to become operational, because in 81, when it was officially founded, 
Thatcher opened the door. That was all. So uh, Stefan was, must be there. Must have been there, but none of us were there because there was no there was no institute yet. So in '82, when IPA began to be operational, little by little, the outlook was somber. But yet the founding fathers of IPA were convinced and steadfast. When I had barely arrived in Maastricht from Florence to take up my position in the institute in the autumn of that year, two prominent Europeans were tasked by the European Parliament to design a strategy for the EU to escape uh, from the trap of stagflation and to design a different and promising longer-term reinvention of European integration. One was Professor Ball, leading the London Business School. The other was Michel Albert, leading the famous French Commissariat General Duplan. The cost of non-Europe report to the European Parliament early in 1983 was genuinely distinct and had, and actually still has, a major impact. Another critical person who never actually was given the credit he fully deserves was EEC Commissioner Karl Heinz Nariès. Who knows him? Everybody talks about Cofield and the law. No. Cofield and the law said, Thank you, Karl Heinz. We'll sell it. He did everything with his team. If you want later literature where this is in detail shown, <coughs> hundreds of pages, I'm happy to do that. Now, yes, managed to convince the council, exactly when the institute was starting, uh, to initiate an internal market council. Now, I'm sure nobody in this room believes that there was not an internal market council that in those days and before there was no specific, regular or in depth attention to the Council for the Internal Market or the Internal Market as such. This is indeed baffling. What, after all, is the EEC, or now the EU, without the internal market? A little more than a talk shop, another OECD European style. So rather than design an economic and monetary union, as the hopelessly flawed uh, Werner report of 1971 was doing, most people don't realize how incredibly flawed that report was. Also there, I'm happy, happy to explain you. And it's also written up, but nobody seems to take it in. The true urgent and very substantial task was to strengthen, deepen, and extend the common market so that it would soon become a single market. The first internal market council was held in November 1982. Both Nayes, in all his uh, modesty, and Albert Ball saw clearly the critical importance of the internal market as the hard core of the community and the true driver for deepening and widening European integration. Striking was the basic paper prepared for that first internal market council, not even 20 pages, Many unknowns, without good data about the numerous inter-EU barriers, basically there were hardly any data, there were some assertions, without even a solid overall survey of the shortcomings of the so-called common market, and without as yet a vision where to go and how to design this route. That first council meeting was a testimony of what European integration had not accomplished. So some of you might remember the front page of The Economist in March 1982. The institute then had not yet opened. It was about to. It was a picture of ten prime ministers on a, on a cemetery. They were encircling a graveyard headstone. And on it was written, here is buried the EEC after 25 years of useless service. Very subtle. The testimony of great shortcomings was exactly what Albert uh, and Ball revealed in another way in that report. These largely forgotten acts by Nariès Koumsouis and, and Albert Ball um, have set in motion in the end, and that I'm not going to describe because then you're here only uh, listen to me to quarter to six, so I'm not going to do that. Um, 
he forgot the next set in motion a fascinating process of genuine and radical deepening as well as decisive widening of the scope of the hard core of the EEC. The way Albert and Ball began their report is really beautiful. They describe a walk in the forest in this month, in the beginning of the autumn. And they describe how outright beautiful the leaves were and the trees and the views. But they knew, and everybody knows, that these beautiful leaves foretell a dramatic decay of these leaves and many plants in the forest. And five weeks later, or even three weeks later, if you come back, you can't believe it was so beautiful before. And it's that decay that they then work out in great detail. The EEC had to turn itself inside out and do much, much better, and also be much more brave. For example, by shedding vetoes in the council, which was thought impossible for at least the internal market decisions, and these are many decisions. AIPA, born in a somber period, so it seems, was lucky. A huge and dynamic agenda was developing and awaiting for it, and soon the changed institutions, 1985, an amended treaty, and new working methods would follow. So don't give up this time. It can be done. Uh, looking back, it's actually amazing how much the EEC has changed, how much deeper it has become, how much the scope has widened, how the EU member state interface has been literally revolutionized, not to speak of the enlargement fever in uh, six consecutive occasions. Okay, we also have Brexit. I'm not going to talk about Brexit. Uh, in this vibrant community, what could AIPA best do? Almost by definition, at least two broad areas of activities. It's quite boring, because you have he heard that already today. In the first place, it should serve civil servants on the interface between the EU and the member states, and sometimes regions too, uh, with a view to execute, implement, and enforce EU decisions and policy where required. And on the other hand, it should be attractive to member states and their civil servants for all kinds of support in the management and development of the governing functions the member states maintain for good reasons in the overall EU system. The latter approach, that is, that member states should not only cherish their own functions, but should perform well in what is not an EU function or not a mixed function is profoundly in the interest of the entire EU system, even if the EU level has zero competences in area X or Y. How, vibra how vibrant and healthy the EU as a whole is depends not only on EU level functions, and indeed also its economy and the Eurozone as its principal component, but also and at least as much on how member states do, how their governments and public administrations perform. Still more actually, the often ill-understood subsidiarity principle, except in this room, of course, but everywhere else, I can tell you it's misunderstood completely, um, is in its core a question of two words, suitability and performance. Is that level of governance suitable to serve its function in the overall EU system? Or is another level of government better able to do that? So it's suitability and performance. Because if it's a lousy performance, you might still perhaps want to change and do some mix, as Ed calls it, or, 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 or arrange it otherwise. So it's suitability and performance, and member states are, in a number of important policy areas, surely more suitable to serve European citizens, more effective than the Union ever be. And that should be the guidance, not political statements, I want that competence back. That's, not, that's a political statement. That's not subsidiarity. So I think that's very important to see. So there is a functional principle where you reason about suitability and performance. Um, for example, in most of the spending ministries, the member states are champion. The EU level is not a spender. Recently a bit more, but still very little, and it's still very special. The EU regulates or forbids but it, it's not a spender. And so spending ministries are typically national. Social and health and education. And, uh, 
where's Monica and, and the army and, and all of that. Um, sorry, I shouldn't see you as the army. But, um, so never imagine that these type of expenditure functions should go to the EU. Who remembers the McDougall report, 1977? Nobody, of course, it, it's when you ask an old guy to enter the conference. Uh, but the McDougall report said exactly that. Let's shift a lot of spending to the EU level. And in a subsidiarity-based approach, a functional one, you should really test whether that adds anything. Um, of course, they had a particular reason for that. I'm not going into that now. So it, it's very important to realize there's a lot of things member states still do, even in, sometimes in regulation in the mix, but sometimes not at all with the EU. And it's very important that member states function well for their citizens, but also that is important for the EU. In pursuing these two complementary approaches, APA is bound to have a very busy agenda. And it's also clear that it needs appreciated expertise and a capacity to bring civil servants from all over the EU together in many policy and implementation areas. And I think that is what IPA has been doing. The additional query is whether IPA should be involved directly with the EU level. And, and Mario will speak uh, more about that. Policy making, execution, implementation. In other words, not supporting national civil service and EU-wide administrative networks in knowledge building on EU affairs, but directly supporting EU institutions, such as the Commission, the Secretariats of the Council and the EP, advisory bodies, like the Commission of the Region, a host of agencies, whether more or less regulatory or otherwise. So rightly or wrongly, the Commission tends to exhibit a, light, a slight inclination to prefer implicit control by keeping things in sight. Uh, still, I read in the IPA annual report of 2020 that you do a lot for these EU institutions. And uh, so you can judge whether what I say here is um, perhaps slightly exaggerated. Um, but I'll give you a very significant example. The enormous campaign to train thousands of commission officials uh, in RIAs, in regulatory impact assessments. A critical activity organized, uh, originated, sorry, from a top committee of director generals of the member states in public administration, chaired by Mr. Mandelkern. You remember him? Doesn't ring about 2001. That's where the RIAs come from in the EU system. By the way, the principles of the Mandelkern report are exactly the same as you mentioned of the 2001 governance. Um, okay, so what happened was that this was kept in the Commission and it didn't work initially. So in SEPS we got every month a call to come and help a specific RIA in the Commission, in secret, which we did. We want to help public functions in the EU, but it's, it's a bit strange. I think, you know, Learning RIAs for thousands of which is typically something that I should do. I think that is really the thing par excellence. European integration is and ought to remain a multi-layered process. But yeah, that is a bit complicated. And since the EU is not a country or a true federation, it can at times be annoying, inefficient or otherwise problematic. So try not to get an ulcer from it. The EU is nonetheless rightly protective of the areas of competence and activities of the member states. And one has to learn in the EU top levels that this is a fundamental property. So I am a very much EU oriented, but I will never, I would never accept that member states' competences are undermined. One such area of contention and inefficiency is the practical effect of the Moroni doctrine. It's another example, and it's not the doctrine itself, it's the practical effects, because it undermines parts of the single market. Ed is pushing me to hurry up, so I will not explain this in detail, but I can tell you that the recent development of what, as Alan knows, of mellowing this, this doctrine and finding a number of ingenious ways, some of which have been discussed today, with networks and all sorts of other things, Little by little, 
improve the situation, but we still don't have, with the Moroni doctrine, internal markets of gas, electricity, telecoms, and freight rail, the four most difficult network industries. We have no true internal markets, and there is only one reason, in my view. That's the Moroni doctrine blocking the EU agencies can actually do the hard work that is needed to. I'm going to have to I think, suggest that we come to, otherwise it's not going to be time for Madame Rav to come in. If you don't. Sure. So vibrant, active and competent national administrations, understanding profoundly what their role and potential in the EU is or could be, and what they best do themselves or with other member states in their networks, I find crucial for them as well as for the overall health of the Union. I congratulate IPA once again, and I'm sure that the officials of both levels of government need you and will frequently enjoy your services. Thank you very much. Jack, thank you very much indeed for that enlightening as well as encouraging. Thank you very much for that, which is, I, without further ado, going to be the bridge to hand over to our final speaker who I hope is online and available. We're sorry for the slight delays. Yeah. Ah, there is. Oh, I'm online. So, I'm available. And I must say, like always, I have enjoyed Jack a lot. So <laughs> it could have continued for longer and longer. Thank you very much. <laughs> Jack, it's, uh, it's great to be back, as you said. It's even greater to be back and be on a panel with you. And uh, we have turned a few stones together in the past, and I'm sure We'll continue, we'll continue to do it. So first of all, many thanks for the invitation. Second best wishes for the 40 years. And uh, as we say in Italian, for the next 400. Uh, so enjoy. <laughs> and I think what you did uh, is, uh, is something very crucial. You have uh, trained uh, several waves of uh, uh, civil servants, maybe a couple of generations, but in particular, several waves because as you know, we tend to get them in, uh, in waves through some of the intricacies that uh, the Jack was, uh, was explaining. But what is true is that during those waves, the type of uh, bureaucrats that we need have changed. The type of the bureaucrats has changed a lot. And I think you have been still able to, to train. Now, the crux of the matter is that uh, the world is changing, and this is a banality. We all know the world is changing. What is less of a banality is that the world is changing now. So now, really now, in this year and a half, I think we have had more disruption than uh, probably in the 20 years before, even if in 20 years before we had an exogenous crisis and a self-inflicted endogenous crisis. Still, the amount of disruption that came from, uh, from the COVID is probably much, much bigger than anything else. What is good is that, as the old saying goes, uh, you don't waste a good crisis, and uh, that's, I think, what Europe has, has not done for all its uh, difficulties, but certainly we did not waste a, a, a good crisis. Why? Because the crisis brought us to rethink. We have rethought a lot. When you take the pain, and um, I'll do it regularly with my, with my students, I'm sure Jacques and the others who, who have the pleasure to go in a classroom do it as well, when you take and you put uh, on, a, on a table the last three crises and you look at the way we have solved them, I mean, that's day and night. I mean, the, we, they've changed. The way we reacted has changed dramatically. Macroeconomists always used to say, it's not the crisis that matters, it's the reply to the crisis. If you give a bad reply to the crisis, then you amplify it. And I think this time uh, we, have probably, we have probably got it right. Why we have got it right, uh, and what do I want to talk to you about today? Because at the end, you are APA, so PA stands for public administration. So that's what I want to talk to you about, not about, uh, not about macroeconomics. Although, like Jacques, I appreciate the fact that you ask two economists to close the conference. So there must be something <laughs> behind it, and, uh, and this uh, is certainly a good choice. But I think the first thing we learned is that um, public administration matters a lot for the, economic, for the economic cycles and through the economic cycles. We have been living a few years thinking that, after all, these bureaucrats we can do without or we reduce them to, a, to the bare minimum and that's more than okay. Um, in reality, no. In reality, plenty of literature, as Jacques was saying, if you need it, 
Ask Daniel who is in the room or ask myself. I'll give you tons and tons of pages that shows that a good and strong resilient public administration uh, compensate, reduces the, the downside part of the cycle, but most importantly, amplifies the upside, the upside of, the, of the cycle. So that's clearly one thing that came out clearly from the crisis. So on that, I want to talk to you about uh, three points uh, in, the, in the few minutes I have. One is that public administration do face uh, today many challenges, but also many opportunities, and we'll look at a couple together. Second, uh, that the EU as well has changed. I was saying at the very beginning, you have trained several ways of, uh, of uh, Eurocrats, but we are changing. And, uh, and one thing we are doing uh, differently from the past is that we are supporting member states uh, into, into this. So our function has become also a bit of an advisory function. And third, of course, is that together, uh, where together means uh, institutions like you, member states, commission, regional, very aptly, I heard uh, in uh, Edward in your introduction that the regional, the regional level was, uh, was introduced. Uh, together, we can get to, to a solution. So the first point, challenges and opportunities. Let us be clear, the biggest challenge, of course, has been the COVID pandemic. Nobody was prepared to it, although there were plenty of papers that told us that sooner or later we come, but nobody took it seriously. Boom, it came, big impact on the, big impact on the economy. The opportunities that we took was immediately the one to understand uh, in four weeks and not in four years, as we did in the previous crisis, that uh, national solutions to a global problem would simply not work. So we tried also this time a couple of national solutions. They were obviously inadequate. So we moved uh, to, the, to the European global solution. And, uh, and, uh, and, and of course, the, the thing changed. Notice that at the very beginning, uh, one of the reasons why, for example, all through the pandemic, financial markets held up is through the mechanism of expectations because we were able to create expectation that we would, uh, that we would move out. Of. But I think another important point is where we create the next generation U. Within the next generation U, as you know, we created the recovery and resilience facility. The passage from fund to facility which is often not uh, stressed enough, has been absolutely crucial. A fund, as we all know, is something that you find in the treaty, is something that reimburses for expenditure and for costs. A facility is completely different. A facility is something that presupposes you have a plan, presupposes you have milestone and targets, and pays if you fulfill milestone and targets. This is a Copernican revolution, because these simply means that the agreement is not anymore a redistributive <coughs> agreement, as it is in the case of fund, but it becomes an allocative agreement because it becomes an agreement whereby member states decide how to allocate. And that's why uh, in July they were able to decide in favor of 1.8 trillion, which <coughs> end, in June, end in January, so two months before the COVID pandemic, they were not able to agree on 15 uh, billions. So why in six months uh, uh, the member states were able to agree on a budget and on a, on a let's say, an expenditure 120 times bigger, simply not, not just because of the emotion of COVID that had been big, of course, but because of the complete change in the mindset. I think the mindset has become much more a reform and an investment mindset. And I think this is what Europe was, uh, uh, Europe was after. What does it mean, a reform and an investment mindset? It means that we have to look, for example, at infrastructure investment. We look at efficient buildings. We look at the type of workspace. workspace. We look at the mobility, the type of mobility. But most importantly, I think, is that we look at projects. We force public forces too much. We nudge public administrations all through Europe to plan, design, and then, and then implement. And that's the true issue, the, the implementation character of Europe. I mean, if you think beginning of 2000, and, uh, and Jack has been very good to mention the various reports, Dagal and then Werner, and then the following one. But at the beginning of 2000 was a period of regulation. Yes, it was. We were doing lots of directives. Then at some point, we started doing regulation. Now we are doing more and more 
practical things. Who would have said that we can go around Europe because into this thing there is uh, the uh, there is the Green Pass, which after all has been uh, an invention in here in the buildings of the of the Europacy. So I believe all these practical aspects that we have been uh, that we have been putting forward, of course, has uh, has changed the dimension. But if you think, uh, we we wrote uh, uh, Daniel and his team wrote a fantastic. Uh, staff working document uh, in April this year, which details all the challenges. Uh, do please read uh, that paper. I cannot go through them all. But let me point out of, of two which are, uh, which are quite crucial. One, of course, is the one of uh, democratic change, uh, demographic changes. Europe is going through massive demographic changes in one direction. And those massive demogra demographic changes in one direction may mean rapidly skill shortage. Some countries in Europe, not only they have a democratic change, but then they have the brain drain, which means even more a skill shortage. So the question of leadership, the question of capacity building will be a huge question for public administration. But the other biggest complexity is that problems have become more difficult than they were. Let's face it. I mean, uh, the problems that we have are the so-called super weak problems. They are problems which are complex have to do with transition, first of all, and we all know that a flow is more difficult than a stock to manage, to, to understand, but also they have to do with uncertainties. I mean, the green transition is gas good, uh, is somehow is good, but uh, uh, digital transition, we have to deal with many uncertainties. Do we know what will happen to the technology in a few years? Will it make uh, for example, nuclear safer than it is today for the transition. All sorts of things that, uh, that clearly we possess less and we know less uh, than, uh, than, than many others. And then if uh, most of this is done at the regional level, so national level and then goes down to the regional level, well, here is a big task for the public administration to make sure that they have a tall the levels that decide a good amount of people that do not suffer from skill shortage and that they, they can do the job. But furthermore, the difference of uh, uh, having uncertainties or not having uncertainties is the difference between being ready and prepared. Being ready means that you decide once the conference is finished that you go to have a drink, you are ready for the drink at six o'clock. Good. Being prepared means that you have all the skills in order to face something that today you don't know what it is so that you are relatively prepared to face uh, uncertainties. And I think this is more and more what, uh, uh, what, will, uh, what will come. So these are only two, and then, as I said, Daniele will give you the details of, uh, of many others. But then the second point I want to talk to you is that for as difficult and daunting as this may be, the good news, I believe, is a good news, is that the Commission, now since 10 years, have learned that uh, we we cannot leave member states alone. In this. So we are there to, to accompany member states into, into this. Over the last 10 years, essentially the advisory function of the Commission have been, uh, have been enhanced a lot. The, the directorate where Daniel and myself work is a, is a large part, a large part of our, of our mandate is exactly a mandate of assisting uh, member states' public administration in the design, in the development, and of course in the implementation of the of the policy so the good thing is that there are instruments the one probably most well known is the technical support instrument but there are instruments which are there and which are available for that i don't have time i see my time is elapsing but we have done very very high number of uh, of projects we we took them uh, in the in the hundreds so 160 to 100 uh, projects overall technical support project in the area of the governance and, uh, and public administration. And in that area, we really see how, as we all know, uh, member states have first got aware of the need to do something, so problem identification, Jack was talking about the RIS, problem identification, then options, and then solution. It's a process, it's a process that we need to accompany but my sensation is that, is that we are a company. There is one important thing in this process, which is when you look to the future, when you look to the plan, 
more and more becomes important to have some anticipatory governance and foresight. What we economists call the Sambayesian analysis. So being able to infer from few data in the past what may come, may come in the future. And I think this is probably looking to the future is the title of my, of my intervention is one of these areas that we need to develop. To conclude, I believe we can win this. this. This will not be easy, but I believe we can do it. But none should think uh, that he can do it alone. I mean, alone, uh, it simply will not work. We will not do it alone here from Brussels. We will not be the member states alone, let alone the regions. And we will not be able to do it if we will not have institutes like yours who help us. I mean, it's very, very clear that uh, the sort of support that we receive from from institutes like yours are quite uh, are quite uh, are quite massive i mean they are in the area of peer based learning they are in the area of exchange of knowledge simply in the area of research because after all i mean as as academics we we truly believe uh, we truly believe in research so with these uh, i uh, once again i want to thank you and to wish you all the best for the for the next uh, 400 years as i said <laughs> what you have done what you have done is really an integral part of what we have done because what we have done is to change a lot as i started at the beginning the world is changing the fact is that it's changing now and it's probably changing today is lower than it will change tomorrow so i said you deal with transition that means dealing with the flow and that's the first order derivative, I think we will soon go and deal with the second order derivative, with the speed of the change, because the speed of the change is, is inevitably increasing. And this is something which, uh, uh, which, uh, which we need to take into account. This will be crucial for the recovery, but this will also be crucial for the resilience. We have chosen a model of recovery which is not banned, is not helicopter money, is not money on citizens' account and then citizens will spend and something will happen to the aggregate demand. Not at all. It's a model of recovery which gives the priorities that the citizens have told us, in particular the young citizens, the new generation, the green, the digital and all of that. And in all of these institutes like yours, the role of public administration is extremely crucial. Thank you very much and have a great <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much indeed. I'd like to hand over at this point to round off and, and thank you both to Cecilia. Will you come up here now? And I think that's probably the best thing for you to take over here. Yeah. Hi, don't leave me. Sit. Stay with me. Stay with me. Giving you lots of space. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your intervention also, Mr. Neva. And uh, it's, uh, it has come to me as a very dear duty now to summarize this day. And how we, do we do that? Well, APA is now 40 years, looking forward to the 40, 41st year, and then to the 50th anniversary, and so on, until 400 years, as you just said. Uh, now, what are we here for? I was thinking to myself, how to summarize this? And I think I will do it with a quote by a young boy in Malta. His name is Larkin Zara. He's now not that young anymore, but, he, but when he said this, he was 17 years old, he said, the European Union was, to my grandparents, a far away dream. The European Union was, to my parents, a challenging process and the European Union is to me an everyday reality and I think that is in a very short in a family a family sitting at the same table celebrating a Sunday dinner have these three perspectives at the same time the challenge now for this young boy, who now has turned into a European civil servant, and he's in Brussels, is to make these words become reality in his everyday work. I believe that a lot has to do with trust. 
I served democracy for 17 years as an elected member in the national and the European Parliament. It's, that is to be really serving people, never to rule the people, but always be there to serve. And the same goes for civil servants in every institution, in every member state. We are never there to rule, but always to serve citizens. That is a key element. And when that happens, public administration can be reinforced and really accommodating the need of, of citizens. Who on earth would love the European Commission as such? or the European Parliament, or even, <laughs> or even feel, you know, inspiration for APA or for European Council, God forbid. But when citizens meet committed civil servants, it can mean really the, the difference. They can bring about change in a different perspective, meeting citizens with with knowledge, with respect, can reinforce the European project from within. And this is what is needed. So I believe that trust is a key element in every education, in every institution, for all of us. And I really wish that we at APA, in, in coming activities, will never forget that we are never there to rule, we are always there to serve, and we are there to meet citizens with trust. Give them hope, and doing so, we increase the hope and the prosperity, and we actually foster something very important within the institutions and the member state, namely to believe in the European project. And that needs to be reinforced. So I hope that we now will take up coming duties with a lot of enthusiasm. We have inspired each other during this day, and it's not over. We will now continue our conversations over dinner. And uh, I thank you again for having attended here. And I thank you for everything that you have done so far during these 40 years. But I thank you even more for what you haven't done until now, but will do in days to come. Thank you very, very much. <laughs>